Regardless of whether you have one contributor or even a thousand contributors, bug tracking is still going to be an incredibly useful tool to keep track of the issues you have reported as well as what work has actually already been done. The problem with a lot of bug trackers though is they're mainly web-based. What if you want to report bugs while you're offline? Let's say you're on a plane. You can already go and work on the code base and make commits to Git then. Why can't you report bugs? And let's say you want something that doesn't lock you into a specific service. Let's say you want to be able to share the bugs over to GitHub or GitLab or Jira. And what if you want something that is fully embedded in Git so that if you go and share the repo, someone else has a copy of all of those bugs? And what if you want it to be lightning fast? Well, how about you try out something like Gitbug? Gitbug is a really cool project. It comes with three interfaces, the CLI interface, the term UI interface, which is just a 2E interface, and a web UI interface, and the web UI is actually hosted locally. And when you install the application, you actually get all of these three together. Now, the CLI integrates directly with Git, so you can actually go and run Gitbug as a subcommand of Git. So before you can do anything with Gitbug, you first need to have a user. Now, if you're doing stuff by yourself, what you can do is Gitbug user create, and that will let you create a new user. So in this case, it's going to try to default the name to Brody Robertson. I'm going to say, yeah, that's fine. And then it's going to ask for my email address. That's also fine. And then it's going to prompt you for an avatar URL. That's going to be shown on the web UI, but I don't really care about having an avatar. So we're going to skip past that. And now it's actually made us a new user. And then that user will be able to do stuff inside of Gitbug and you've been assigned to that user. Now, if you're working with other people or for whatever reason you need to delete the repo and then pull it back down again, it will pull down all of the bugs and all of the users, but you won't actually be assigned to the user even if you went and created them. So what you're going to need to do is adopt that user. So we can check the users that exist by doing git bug user ls and that will list out all of the users right now there's two versions of Brody robertson i'm currently assigned to this one here but let's say i want to go and adopt this one here what we can do is git bug user adopt and then like with most things in git just pass in the identifier for it and then it will go and do it so 106 2623 and now my identity has been changed now that we have a user let's go and make our first bug so git bug add and then if we go and run this, it's going to open up our text editor. This is going to check your editor variable. In my case, that's set to NeoVim, but you might be using Nano or whatever it is you're using. Now, this works the same way as creating issues with things like the CLI GitHub client. So the first line is going to be the title of the bug. This is a title. And then any line after a space is going to be the description. So let's say just description. If we go and save this now, it's going to go and create a new bug. Now we can check the existing bugs by doing git bug ls. And as we can see, this is a new bug and that's the one that we just created. We can do some more stuff with ls afterwards, but for now, that's all we need. So now that we've actually made the bug, like with stuff we normally do inside of git, it's just going to be stored locally on our system. It's not going to be in the remote repo until we go and push it up. So if we go and do a git bug push, this is going to push it to our default remote. If you want to go and send it to a different remote, you can then include another value with a URL to that remote. But in this case, that's going to be fine. If we go and run that, give it a second, it should go and push it up to the ST remote I have on GitHub. And there we go. And then like you'd normally expect, if you want to go and pull down some changes, we can do a git bug pull, and then it'll bring those changes down from the remote and in this case, there was nothing to merge, so it's all done. When we're working on a specific bug, it might make it easier if we go and enable implicit selection to make it so we don't have to include an ID for every single command that we run. So if we go and do git bug select and then pass in the ID of what we want to select. So like with many things in git, you don't have to include the entire ID just enough to make it unique. So I'm going to include 428 and now that bug is selected. So both of these commands work in an implicit way. So now we can go git bug title edit, and now we can actually go and edit the title. You might see that we can't actually edit the description, and that's something that's actually missing from the command line version. We can do that in the term UI version though, so it's a compromise that works. I don't know why it's designed like this, and we can't do something more explicit. Like let's say git bug 
and then title, pass in the ID, and then do an edit. Now, as for labels, they provide a way to group different bugs together. So we could go and have like a backend label for backend bugs, or UI label for UI bugs, or SQL label for SQL bugs, things like that. So if we go and do a git bug label, and then add to go and add the bug, so let's go and add it. Then we can go and do a git bug label rm, and the same label to remove the label. Now, one problem with this is there's currently no way for the maintainer to enforce a specific set of labels. So normally in a bug tracker or maybe with the issues on GitHub, you would have a list of labels that are allowed and those are the only ones you can use. In this case, we can go and add whatever labels we want and there's no way to check that those are supposed to be in the repo. So currently the way that listing out labels works is any of the labels that are currently in use, those are going to be the labels that show up if we do a git bug label and then ls. So in this case, I have two labels, new label, and the one we just made, UI. A bug tracker wouldn't be very useful if we couldn't go and comment on bugs. So if we go and do a git bug comment and then add, this is going to open up our text editor and we can go and leave a comment on this. So let's just put some garbled text in here. If we go and save this, it's going to add a new comment to that. And if we just do a git bug comment, this is going to list out all of the comments. Now, I presume it's supposed to be git bug comment ls, but you don't actually need to run the ls part. Now, if we're done with the bug, we can go and close it by doing a git bug status and then close. And that will go and close the bug. We can go and confirm that by doing a git bug ls. And as we can see, that bug is now closed. And then obviously a git bug status open will reopen it. If we want to go and see all the information about the bug we have selected, what we can do is git bug show. And this doesn't just show the comments, it also shows the labels, who's working on it, and when it was created. And then once you're done working on a bug, you can do a git bug deselect, and then no longer have implicit selection enabled. We can demonstrate that by doing a git bug comment, and we'll see it's going to complain that we don't have an ID or a select command first. Earlier I mentioned there was more to doing ls, so if we do a git bug ls-h, all of the sub commands do actually have their own documentation, like everything does normally in git. We can actually go and filter things by how they're actually listed out in the bug tracker, so we can go and filter by the status, or by the author, by the participants, the actor, label, or title. Basically, you can go and search for things exactly the way you want to search for them. This can be useful if you've had a bug tracker around for a while, and you've got hundreds of completed bugs, and you don't want to see those, you just want to see the bugs that are still open. You can go and filter by what's still open, and only see those. For the most part, the CLI tool is going to be the primary way that you work with Gitbug, but if you want to go and use the TUI interface, if you go and run Gitbug term UI, it will go and open that up. If you're ever unsure about the keys, they'll always be listed along the bottom. So let's go into this bug by pressing enter on it. And let's say I want to go and modify the description. Now you can see there's an edit key right here, but the way you go and edit it is a bit weird. So firstly, we have to go and select it with our arrow keys. And now we can go and edit this. The reason why it's like that is because we can also go and select the labels to go and edit those. But I'm going to go and edit this one and it'll open up my editor. Let's go and add some random text in here. And if we go and save this now, as we're going to see, the comment has been updated. One slightly weird thing about this is you can't actually use the edit option to go and modify the title. That's because modifying the title has its own dedicated key. So pressing T will let me go and do that. I don't know why it's like that. Instead of just using the method we have here, it would make more sense to me to have the editing being consistent. Now, on bugs that do actually have more than one comment, we can actually go and modify the comments as well. So let's go into the closed bugs. So if we go and swap that over to closed, now we'll see this bug is right here. Let's go and modify this one right here. So as we can see, we can modify it just like the description. Before we go any further, I just want to talk about the way this search works, because this might be a little bit weird. Basically, it defines what is going to be shown in the UI based on what is set up here. So on the left hand side is the parameter you're searching with, and then the right hand side is the value you want it to match. So in this case, it's only showing things that are status equals closed. But we can also do things like searching by the author or the title or the label. Basically, it's a weird way to do the sorting, but I think it gives you a lot of power. And luckily, every time you try to do a sort, it's going to show you this documentation, so you don't have to try to work it out as you go. 
Now, when it comes to editing the labels, if we go and press E on that selection, we'll see that because we actually have two labels in here, it's going to give us the option to go and do something with them. So if I go and press enter on the label, it's going to go and deselect it. So as we can see, that label is no longer in the list. If we want to go and add a label though, what we can do is press the A key and then it'll ask us what the label is going to be called. I'm just going to say test label. If we go and press enter again, now that label is actually on that bug. The web UI on the other hand is a little bit beta. So if we do a git bug web UI, it's going to try and open that up. Usually it's not going to work on the first shot. Usually it opens up the website quicker than the... Uh, the web UI can actually be loaded, so if you go and close your browser and reopen it, it's usually going to work. This is effectively just a GUI version of the term UI, but a lot of the features are currently missing, so it is still a work in progress, but I think at some point this actually will be useful. And then when it comes to working with a bridge, basically the first thing you're going to want to do is go and configure the bridge, and then once that's been done, everything just works the exact same way as working with a remote, except instead of just doing a pull and a push, you do a bridge pull and a bridge push, and it all just magically works. Now, not everything that works inside of those bug trackers actually works inside of Gitbug and vice versa. So make sure you go and check out the supported feature list. And if you want to use Launchpad, well, don't use Launchpad, but GitHub is probably the most supported right now. Now, when I say that everything is stored inside of the Git repo, I don't mean that it makes a bunch of junk files inside of your regular files. What it actually does is stores the files inside of the .git folder in a folder called gitbug. I have no idea how this magic is actually working, but if you want to go and explore these files, that's where everything's going to be stored. That's going to be pretty much everything for me. I highly, highly recommend checking this out for yourself, especially if you want to have some really simple way to go and manage all of your bugs. Obviously, it's not perfect, and if you have contributions from people that you don't really know, they can very easily start just spamming in random labels and messing up all your bug tracking, but if all the people working on the project you trust, I think this is something that might actually be worth trying out. So that's going to be pretty much everything for me. But before I go, I would like to thank my supporters. So a special thank you to Joachim, Donald, Logan, Michael, Andre, Nathan, David, Carl, Will, Brennan, Chica, Bento, Jamie, Joseph, Josh, Mitchell, Stephen, Tease, Theroux, Tony, Shushar, and all of my $2 supporters. If you'd like to support my work, the links down below to my Patreon, subscribe, start, leave, pay, all that sort of stuff. I've got my podcast, Tech Over Tea, available basically anywhere. And I also do a gaming channel. I play games twice a week on Twitch and YouTube, and this channel's available on Odyssey as well, so I think that's everything for me, and I'm out.